with his latest book, The New Urban Agenda, The Greater Toronto and Hamilton Area. Bill's written a, in a wide variety of genres. And he probably, he first got famous for his um, series for young people called The Bain Series. He's also written film and television scripts, documentaries, theatrical plays, and educational videos. His books for adults usually follow political, historical, or social, and social themes. Some of the awards he's won for his writing include the Governor General's Award for Juvenile Fiction and two awards from Heritage Canada, Heritage Toronto, pardon me. Um, Bill has a PhD in sociology from McMaster University and is past chair of the Writers' Union of Canada. He lives on Toronto Island, and I assume that's to escape the problems you're discussing in here. Um, copies of the new Urban Agenda are, um, are available for sale here from our friends at Dundurn Press right over here, and it's just $20, so it's on a sale price for you today, especially. Um, so um, Bill has a presentation, and he will take questions from you at the end. And so please stick around and help me welcome Bill Freeman. Thank you very much. I'm told that uh, council is in session. Uh, I don't know if that's appropriate or not, but uh, uh, my book does, in fact, talk of fair bit about council and a lot of the problems that I see in, on council, but essentially what, uh, what it focuses on is the, the urban problems that we're facing. And it's a, this, is, uh, this is not only huge problems, but I think it's a thing that's really grasped the imagination of many people here and many people across the city. And I, uh, the book is subtitled, uh, you know, The Greater Toronto Hamilton Area. And the, uh, incidentally, I, I lived in Hamilton for 10 years, so I was rather, I'm rather still very fond of Hamilton. And uh, I wanted to include Hamilton because the province uh, now talks of the, about the GTHA, the H for Hamilton. Why? Because the, Hamilton is being integrated into the broader transit uh, plan that they have they have developed it's been it's been very exciting for Hamilton because they suddenly have much better transit than they have or access. A large number of people are are commuting every day into uh, into the GTA. So I mean that's that's I think the right move that the province is doing. And I want to point out as well that you know my book. My book is a critical book, but it's also a hopeful book. You know, I, I see hope for a lot, of, a lot of things in Toronto. So let me just run through this uh, PowerPoint. It has, it's a sort of summary uh, of, of some of the key ideas, and I'll, I'll talk to those ideas. So uh, this is where we're at. Uh, in turn, I gotta read it very, oh, maybe I should read it here. So, Canada is a very urban uh, nation now. We, a, lot of our, a lot of people find that hard to believe, but 80% of people live in urban centers. And this is a thing that's very striking, is that the greater Toronto area, you know, including Hamilton, is now the fourth largest urban center in North America. That's after New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, and then comes Toronto. We are a very important center here, very important business center, particularly finance. And, uh, and uh, uh, you know, there, in terms of media, in terms of a large number of, from fashion to design, we've, we're a very important urban center. And uh, the area is growing, 100,000 people a year. That's almost entirely from immigrants. The immigration into Canada is a little better than, uh, it's about 240,000 uh, people this year. And uh, we're getting about 100,000 of them. There, you know, so there's people that, of course, that come into Toronto, but we, there's also people that leave. So basically, you know, the growth in the population is a result of immigrants. And immigrants are a very important part. So that, you know, the prediction, I mean, what are predictions? 2040, 10 million people. That's, that's what's expected. So I wanted to sort of briefly look at the different types of city. And you, and you know, so I started with a very handsome photo of, uh, of uh, uh, Victorian houses in Toronto that have been gentrified. This is the inner core. And what has happened in the, in the inner core, of course, we know, and we're going to talk about 
the condos that are being developed here, the businesses that are the business, the office development as well. But there's still this old residential pre Second World War neighborhood. That's if you, for those of us you who've been around Toronto, know that that's the old city of Toronto before amalg amalgamation, before mega city. So they don't, not all the houses are like this, but it, it, it also is an important point for our story about Toronto because these are gentrified houses and that's been going on across, across, uh, the, across the old city. And this is characteristic of, this is Scarborough actually, um, and high rise. So that there are, there are about, there, there were a whole series of high rise buildings that were built in the inner suburbs of, uh, of Toronto. The inner suburbs, Scarborough is one, North York, parts of Etobicoke, those are, those are called the inner suburbs. That's a sort of journalist's shorthand. You know, the inner suburbs are the ones within the city of Toronto. The outer suburbs are the Mississaugas and the GTA, the outside the geographic boundaries of Toronto. Now, what is happening is that uh, because of gentrification and because of prices within the city of Toronto, a lot of middle and low income people are, are leaving Toronto. They're not being forced out because, you know, we don't, we don't live in that sort of a city. And they're coming to live in, in, uh, in high rise such as this. There are still, of course, a lot of single family houses that are, that are in, in that area as well. But it's, it's distinctly different, if you will, than the downtown. And this, of course, is uh, Mississauga. You know, there's uh, all across the GTA. It's quite a, quite a new uh, uh, development, a new suburb. Uh, notice uh, the garages out in front. Car-dependent communities, that's what we have. That's a part of Marco. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's what that's what this, the new face of the suburbs, you know? Uh, com compact urban form. Densities are still fairly low, though, compared to some of the densities you're going to see in Toronto. Uh, but so that, so that the GTA particularly, you know, the Mississaugas, uh, the uh, Markham, Vaughan, Pickering, this is, this, is, this is where the middle class have gone. And the characteristic of all suburbs is transit is terrible and people depend on their cars. And this, is, this leads, to, of course, to serious problems for us. Hamilton, Hamilton, I wanted to throw this in because the book is, you know, includes Hamilton. Hamilton is very much like a smaller version of Toronto. It's a city of about 500,000. They've gone through mal amalgamation as well. Uh, Hamilton now includes some of the rural areas, the old city, the old county of Wentworth, which is fairly, but the inner core of the city uh, is much like this. There's a lot of deterioration in downtown Hamilton that the politicians have been trying to solve since back in the days when I lived there in the 1960s, when uh, Mayor Vic Copps sort of tore the center of the city apart with urban renewal, which, well, we're not going to talk about that, but I've never. <laughs> So, I'm sorry if you can't read this, but essentially this is, this is a chart, this pretty key chart, and it shows what's happened with the city, is that now the GTA, this does not include uh, Hamilton on my site, now the GTA is about 3.5 million people, and Hamilton, or Toronto, the city of Toronto is about 2.8 million. So that the GTA, the suburbs are now, that is, the outer suburbs are now larger than the downtown. So this is the character of what's, what's emerging. So that sort of form of the city leads to what I call the old urban agenda. So the old urban, so the big sub suburbanization happened after the Second World War. About 1950 is usually the, the time that people talk, to, talk about going up to about 2000. Suburbanization. Suburbanization is still going on. And uh, let's see if I can read this. So, suburbs, urban sprawl, loss of, loss of farmland, good farmland. This is, you know, some of Canada's best farmland is here in southern Ontario. 
adjacent to Toronto, low density communities, okay? Compared to, compared to almost anywhere in Toronto. Uh, car dependency, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it's not that we should be blaming people that live in the suburbs, they basically have no choice. If, you know, if you're gonna, there are many, many families, I, I know families themselves, who, myself, who, uh, you know, every adult in the family who live in the same, they, ha they have to have a car. So, I mean, that leads to, of course, first of all, it, it led to real pressure on building highways and expressways. Enormous amount of uh, funds went into that from, uh, you know, this, this is many, some, some suburban people say, oh, we don't re receive any uh, subsidies. Excuse me, the highway, uh, the highway construction alone that went on for decades and decades and continues, I might say, was enormous. And, and, and why? I mean, political pressure on, uh, on building, it's just the only way people get around. Um, th there is a change there as well, but we'll, we'll, come, we'll come to that. Um, gridlocks, long commutes, everything that we've been talking about. I say unaffordability. It, it, there is a real affordability problem not only you know in in Mississauga, all the studies are showing this. Poverty is increasing. Uh, the the cost of living there. Spent property taxes are high. Why? It's not that they're awful municipalities. It's they're expensive to be able to service low density communities. It's it's a thing we gotta we gotta begin begin to understand. And so you know those those ring of prosperous, what would appear, uh, su suburban communities, Mississauga, Brampton, Vaughan, Markham, Pickering, all of them. You look at the, the, the property taxes that they're paying, they're substantially higher than Toronto, substantially higher. And that's because it's expensive for the municipalities to, to service these low-density communities. Uh, so. I then talk about the new urban agenda. This is what my book's about, and that my, my book is really, you know, in the first part of the book describes what the way the city is, and I spent much of the book talking about what we can do. Okay, and this is, I feel, is a positive message. It's something that we gotta think about. It's not gonna happen overnight. But we're gonna, we, we got to begin to, to build affordable communities. Affordable communities. Uh, and that means, that will mean increased densities. You know, the, the, the uh, some people, you know, there's, will, they, will the single family home continue? Of course it'll continue. There's lots of it out there. There's lots of it in Toronto for that matter. But more and more people, higher proportions of people in Leafs in this city are gonna be living in, in apartments, or condos, and whatever. So, the quality of your life, I, I, I mean, this is, this is to me, is very, very important. I think that, that we need to be thinking more and more about the quality of life of our neighborhoods. Neighborhoods are very important. That's how most of us relate. I live on Toronto Island. If you've ever been to Toronto Island, you know that's a strong community. In fact, Toronto Island is one of the reasons why I wrote this book. It was, you know, I was inspired by Toronto Island and the way it works. And, uh, you know, and I, I, I know other communities can, can you know, develop a, a much improved quality of life. Uh, environmentally sustainable. Folks, this, is, this we've all got to do. I mean, the, 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 this is not the new urban agenda, this is the, urban, the agenda of politicians. And we're gonna come to talk about this because we have serious problems with becoming a sustainable city. And, uh, uh, and of course, economically viable. We must be economically viable. Okay, so that so that I, this is what I see as the agenda that we must be working on, and we must be seeing things in in a broader and broad terms. But the point is that it can be done, and it has already begun. There's already changes that this, and this is one of the most important changes happening right here where we're standing. And that is the increasing densities in downtown Toronto. And, and uh, I, I write quite a lot about this, and uh, 
This is the old sociologist on me. But I, I perceive that there is, a, there is a, a, a real cultural change that's happening with younger people particularly. They don't, not, they don't want the long commutes. I, I shouldn't say all of them, but many of them don't want the long commutes of their, of their parents. Many of them have come to university here in, in Toronto. They want to be involved in the urban buzz and the urban life, you know, the chance to go to the basketball game or to go to a local bar, to go dancing with their friends, theater. This is what many young people are, are, are seeking out. Now, and, and in fact, the statistics show it, the recent statistics show it on the, the, the demographics of the people that are moving in. They're, they tend to be young. There's a lot of, lot of people who are uh, my age, you know, the people that are boomers that are decided to sell their house out in the suburb and come and move downtown because they want the same sort of thing. I mean, this is one of the great assets of Toronto is the cultural vitality of the city. It's a safe city. It's a city that, that you can come and, and be part of. And that is, that is going to change the city. And it's something that we must build on, I think, is this, this, this cultural change. So, here, you know, this is, this is just about the new condos that are going out. Condos, kind of, there's, there, I'm not going to talk about the, uh, you know, the spike in prices. Affordability is a huge, huge problem. Uh, you know, people are speculating that, you know, there may be a crash in uh, the price of condos. Look, I don't know. People have been doing, <laughs> how long has it been? Ten years people have been talking about that? I, I don't know. The, the prices, the prices are held, holding. So, this is what's happened. Uh, the estimate is around 215,000 uh, people live in the downtown core defined from about DuPont Street to uh, the Bay, to, to uh, the Don and Bathurst Street, and of course the waterfront. And uh, uh, most of that has come in the last 10 years. Most of it's come in the last 10 years. But you know, it's not just Toronto that's going through this redevelopment of high, high rise. This is, this is a picture of, of uh, Mississauga. And Mississauga it now has a new plan. You know, there's a lot of pro very progressive people out in some of the suburban communities. And, uh, uh, you know, there used to be the day not very long ago, we, we would talk about uh, Hazel McCallion as being the queen, of, the queen of sprawl, is what my friends used to talk about Hazel. But that's changed, you know? In Mississauga, first of all, Mississauga is totally built out. There's no, there's no, uh, Greenfields yet to, uh, to, there is some in Brampton and certainly in the other municipalities. But if you notice here, this is the downtown park in Mississauga. And these are low density, those are low density um, housing, and you can see them if you could see it if I more clearly. So that the new plan that, that Mississauga, Vaughan, Markham have, are doing is to build intense downtowns. And they're doing it for a couple of reasons. One is they need the tax dollars. They need the tax dollars. It's very interesting because, you know, they're much, much cheaper. Less, less, uh, less. Uh, it's much cheaper to, for the municipality to service people that live in high rise. It's also there's a, there's also a lot of uh, there's also a lot of office buildings in here. But if you take a look around. Uh, Brampton not so much, but Vaughan is building a whole new city center. The new subway that's going to go up there is going to terminate in their city center. A lot of that's going to be walkable, you know, a retail. It's going to be high density core. Vaughan, Vaughan once was the epitome of sprawl. They're changing. You know, I think this is really important. They're changing. Uh, uh, Markham as well. So, so the, those, are, those are the three big ones, you know, Mississauga. Much of the pressure of Toronto uh, is west, but also north. You know, that's, that's where, not, east not so much. There's a whole, I have to talk to a geographer about that. I got some opinions, I'm not sure they're right. But, uh, development has always been to the west in Toronto. It's, it's, uh, it's where the economy is, that's where the jobs are. And that's why people are going out there doing better communication, better uh, things. So, so, 
you know, we, we, we can't talk about the suburb, suburbs as just sort of, you know, the, the uh, you know, people that all urban sprawl. There's changes out there, and there's going to be more changes, I think. Well, of course, this leads us to transit. And uh, you know, you've probably all seen that picture or something like it. Oh, that's Toronto for you. Uh, and the, you know, the statistics are not very good. You know, Toronto now has, has the word. They say, the, some people say the worst gridlock in North America. I, I find that a little hard to believe, but uh, I, have, I have read that. Uh, but it is, especially for people that are living in the far reaches of, uh, of Mississauga, let me tell you, it takes a long time to get downtown. And, and this sort of thing is changing the way people are commuting. It is really beginning. If you've ever gone recently on the, on the Lakeshore GO trains, they're packed. They're packed. There now is a commitment to, to make them regular hourly service and, of course, more service at rush hour. And if you've ever been in, well, I live on Toronto Island, so often at rush hour I go through Union Station. You've got, you got to be careful. You don't get trampled for the people you know, running for the... There are just a lot of people coming into downtown Toronto on, uh, on, uh, on go. So, you know, I think that you know, I think we got to really give cre credit to the uh, to the province for its transit plan. Uh, you know, they're they're uh, they're you know, fifty billion dollars is you know pretty scary amount. That's over twenty five years, so that's two billion dollars a year. They've spent about over half of that now. No, not, no, not quite half of that, but it's a lot of money, and they 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 are determined to do it. Um, there could be a change in government, I, I don't know, but um, they're determined. So the, the core of their plan, this is the thing that a lot of people somehow are not understanding, is to build rapid transit. That's what LRT is, that's what subways are, that, that's what the GO train system is, is rapid transit. So they're going to essentially build this skeleton, this infrastructure of rapid transit. And then the local municipalities are supposed to provide, uh, you know, bus service, other types of, you know, what we call lower order. That doesn't sound right, but anyway, if, largely bus services. And that is that. That's easy for Torontonians to do. We've had a, you know, very active, uh, you know, TTC, and we have our problems with the TTC, but it's pretty viable compared to other transit systems in North America, I can tell you. It's very, it's very valuable. And um, uh, so that, so that, um, where was I? So, you know, the province is doing it, but I'm frankly concerned about the, you know, the transit out in the, out in the suburbs, you know, in the Mississaugas, Burlington, all these places. Densities are low. And this, and transit engineers will, will, will tell you, the only way that you can afford good transit is if you have higher densities. That's, you know, that's repeated. If you remember the debate about the uh, Scarborough subway, that's what was said in the press over and over again. No, Rob Ford, we can't build a subway out there. Or, well, we can, but it'll be a waste of money, you know? The existing little uh, stub of, uh, the scar, you know, uh, Shepherd West. I mean, you ever traveled on it? There's nobody on it. So, so you got to have the densities. This is this is the way. This, I mean, this is the logic of it. We got to have the densities to provide the services, to provide the taxes, to provide the 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 transit, and so on. You know, it's it's cumulative. If you build low density sprawl, you are condemning the people that are live there with low services, poor services. Uh, and you know services that is going to have to be shared by a large number of people. That means higher taxes. You know, let's stop talking about taxes. Let's stop talking about building communities that are more efficient, that make more sense. So this is the, this is a very interesting. I started talking a little bit about culture and how cultural changes. Let me see if I can read this. So in 2001, 75% of the real estate sold in the GTA, not Hamilton, in the GTA, were single-family houses. 
Today, in 2015, 65% of the sales are for condos, they're for multi -thing. That's change, that's huge change that's come in 10 years and um, I, I think it's just the beginning. I think it's just the beginning. I think that this reflects a different way that people, people want to live, okay? I mean, it's, there's a lot of young people, a lot of older people. Uh, it's a, is it a cultural change? Well, you know, hey, I'll call it a cultural change. You don't have to be exaggerated, but there is a change on, on the, way, the way that people want, want to live. Here, I mean, that doesn't mean to say it's going to work better where everywhere, you know? So, um, the other problem is, oh, the other point that I was going to make is the cost of housing. And you'll see that's one of the last tags. The GTA house prices have increased 15% in the last year. In the last year, from April to April in the last year. I mean, that was in the newspaper. I didn't invent it. It's, you know, the real estate people are, are saying that. That's huge. That speaks to affordability. It speaks to affordability. Why are people, I mean, I'm talking about a cultural change. People want to go and like to live in it. There's also, you're being pushed by the economics of it. People can't afford to. I'm sure you know lots of young people who would love to buy a house. They cannot afford it. So, you know, where are they going to live? Affordability of housing is causing huge problems, huge problems. It's it, particularly for low-income people. It's, it's very serious. It's very, I mean, I'm, I'm of a generation, I, like I bought a house when I was in my 20s, and I've always benefited from owning that house. I haven't got a lot of money, but I've got a house. You know, young people can't do that. And, you know, we, can, we, we all collectively have a responsibility about this, after all. So, poverty. Well, you can read these statistics. Incidentally, Canadian poverty statistics are terrible. Uh, you know, people don't like talking about poverty, and there's, you know. But these are some studies that have gone on. You know, 145,000 children in uh, Toronto living in poverty. You know, um, it's interesting that the higher rate of poverty for children than for adults. Uh, you know, single people can always, you know, it doesn't cost them so much. You have children, it costs a lot. So, um, generally, it, 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 uh, poverty has increased since the 1980s. Since the 1989, that's sort of a base year, just before the 1990 depression that we, recession, sorry, that we had. Uh, and income inequality, I mean, everybody knows this, income inequality is, is more serious today than it's ever been. I mean, this, is, this has become, you know, something that academics talk about, it's something that, you know, people that are social workers out on the street talk about. You know, it's just housing is consuming a huge number of amount of people's income. Uh, immigrants are particularly having, having trouble. Um, What's that statistic say? 30% of, of, of uh, immigrants are renters, and they pay over 50% of their income. Im immigrants, you know, are attracted to come here, and you know, I, I frankly think we're, you know, we, we're doing a lot of them a disservice. Many of them come with very good qualifications; they can't work at their jobs, and so on, and they, they ended up. You know, but, but this, this is a very telling statistic. If you're paying 50% of your income on putting a roof over your head, that means you've got to scoop, you know. The food banks are booming, and, you know, this is a serious problem. We've got to do something about this. You know, I think people want to do something about that. I'm convinced of it. So, housing. I want to talk about affordable housing. Now, housing has always been controversial. Canada, at one time, had one of the most progressive uh, housing programs in the developed world. We now have no housing project. No federal money goes into housing. The province, uh, the Mike Harris uh, government, uh, uh, killed all of the co-op pro projects that the Bob Ray government had done, and now we're just going. But there are changes. There, you know, a lot of them are coming from Toronto. 
If you know anything about what's happening at your Regent Park, you know that it's being totally rebuilt. It's a brilliant plan. It was, it's being done largely by the city and developers. And what they have is that Regent Park, because of its location, is very valuable land. And so the old buildings, Regent Park, incidentally, I used to, I used to uh, work as a probation officer. Regent Park, at one time, was always said to have the highest crime rates in Canada. No longer, no longer. It was, it was the center of the drug trade. What's, it's being totally rebuilt. If you haven't been down to, to look at Regent Park, go. It is very, very exciting. It's very exciting. This is largely being done by, the city has contributed the land, the developer builds these, and this becomes mixed income housing. There's condos in there, and there's also affordable housing where people are on rent geared to income. And this has got to be the model for a lot of things. That has got to be a model for the future, or we'll never be able to provide the amount of affordable housing that we need in this city. It's going to be horrific, and it's getting worse by the year. You know, if there's a change in government in, uh, in Ottawa, both uh, the Liberals and the NDP, I'm sorry, the Liberals and the NDP have promised uh, money for affordable housing, let's hope they deliver. We gotta make them deliver because, and, it, and deliver not the old Regent Parks. We don't want those anymore. Those are, those are a prescription for social ills and we don't want them. But something like this, there's mixed income housing. There's, you know, this is the sociologist to me talking. This is what changes people, changes families, you know, living in neighborhoods where, they, where they're mixed income neighborhoods. You know, that's what we've got to be building. Co-ops. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I've never lived in a co-op, but I've got a lot of friends who live in co-ops. I'm a great believer in co-ops. For one reason, for one reason, is that co-ops are able to develop a sort of a sense of community. They look after each other. The, the co-op is again mixed housing. It has, in most of them, something in the neighborhood of, of 70 to 75 percent of the of the residents pay market rent or the rent that the you know the co-op sets, and the other you know, and then there's a substantial number of people that are on rent geared to income. Again, it's mixed income, mixed housing, and that's, that's got to be the model that we've got to do. The city has, this city, Toronto, has, has some quite brilliant uh, planners over the years. And one of the plans that I was always uh, attracted to, I think it was over 10 years ago, I first read about how the city was urging higher densities being built along the avenues. They call them the avenues. Housing on the avenues, I think they call it. It looks like this. This is an artist's drawing, and I stole it from somebody's, some, I think, the city site. And um, what, what it does, uh, like they're not high rise, okay? These are buildings, in fact, the city plan was always low, low rise. I mean, if you can call 10 stories low rise, I, I guess it's still not very low rise. But you see how the, how the, um, how the, how the, this is an idealized view, okay? I mean, let me take it from, take it from where it's worth. But you'll notice there's an LRT or a, a going along the street level. There's, there's cyclists. There's pedestrians, nice wide sidewalks for pedestrians. More important, there's retail on the street. If you know some of the old high rise that were built in the inner suburbs, they had no retail. The city wouldn't allow retail. Why? It's beyond, well, because it violated somebody's planning rule. Mistake. This, this would be a, a brilliant thing. This, this, this is almost designed to create communities at the beginning. This is an integrated, the, the vision is as an integrated community with good public services, retail built into it, you know, and mixed incomes. Mixed incomes, okay? Maybe not really wealthy people, but they look after themselves. You know, that's not what's being built downtown. That's not what's being built downtown. It, downtown, they're high-rise towers. 
And they're, by and large, they're not mixed income. They're, they're, uh, they're just not, you know. They're, they're upper income, they're relatively expensive. And uh, so a good affordable housing program, that's the sort of model of community that we really have to be, be thinking about. Is it any more expensive? I don't think so. I don't think so at all. I think that these are, are communities that will be relatively easy to service. They're balanced communities. You can build in amenities as you go, schools, churches, all the things that people need, all the things. Retail, retail's very important. That gives life to the streets. You know, Jane Jacobs was the great person that talked about how, the, how retail really brings back vitality to streets. I think she's right. She's right in a lot of things. So I put this in on here in Ontario Street, again, to reinforce that it's not just, you know, the suburbs aren't sitting still either. Here in Ontario Street, as, as it's now been approved, when I wrote my book, it wasn't approved, but uh, an LRT to go down from, it goes from Port Credit right up to Brampton, connects at the LRT at both sides, at the, I'm sorry, at the, the GO train service at both Port Credit and uh, up at Brampton, and um, regular, and how are they, what are they doing? They're proposing to rebuild the street on both sides of the street with with eight to 10 story uh, uh, condos, uh, affordable housing unit, I hope, and uh, so on. They, they also have designed in, this incidentally comes off Mississauga's own site, you can go and find it. They also put in cycling. Cycling, I imagine people are going to the suburbs riding bicycles. <laughs> hey, that's, a, that's great, that's great. So, I wanted to go on to talk about, geez, how are we doing in time? God. Talk about the whole issue of climate change, pollution, and so on. I mean, you know, I started off by saying this is the, this is the issue of our, of our day. And I, I, uh, I put these in. These, are, these come from the municipalities. One is from Markham, you know, can you say Markham's a, yeah, it's a pretty typical type of suburb. And this is the city of Toronto. But what jumps out at you is there, in terms of air pollution, this is air pollution. Did I call it air pollution? Because there's also such a thing as water pollution. But, then, but it's, it's, it's uh, air pollution. So, um, and the statistics were carried in a, you're composed in a different way. But the two things that are key is the cost of transport, or, or the amount of uh, air pollution created by transportation, that's mainly driving cars. And the other thing that's striking is heating buildings. Now we have a strategy for uh, we have a strategy for reducing air pollution by cars, you know. And some of us dream about electric cars, and uh, transit is all that about. Tra transit, transit uh, is. I mean, thank, thank the world that we have uh, we started on transit. We, we did. We should have st started ten years before. But uh, we can get people out of their out of their cars. And, and taking uh, the whole go system is going to be transformed to into electric. We're going to get rid of all their diesel engines or their trains. I've already said that. But what are we going to do about heating buildings? Heating buildings. Nobody's really begun to, to think about that. Well, in fact, some people have. Some people have talked about that. This is this is an artist's conception of district heating. I'm sorry, Greenwood? The microphone is off Am I not talking? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm usually such a loud person. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so this is, this is what they call district heating. And in fact, Toronto has a unique district uh, uh, heating and cooling of buildings in the downtown core, mainly the public buildings. Um, David Miller, when he was mayor, wanted to extend that to the entire downtown. Hasn't happened. Why? Something called political will. But this is what's going on. It's these types of schemes. Like, this is the thing that really struck me. It's not for want of good ideas in the technology. There's lots of great ideas out there. Let me tell you what, what the city of wealth is putting in a district heating system for, 
for about 75% of the, of the city. It's remarkable. And uh, why Guelph? Well, Guelph, as if you know anything about Guelph, it's always been a very progressive city. They've done a lot of very progressive, uh, progressive things. The idea is you bury pipes, and the ins those are insulated pipes, and one of those pipes will carry hot water that will go to buildings, and with what they call heat transfer uh, things, very simple te technology, you, you suck the heat out of the water and heat your building. And the same is true, the other one will be for cold water. And they, you, you, that's how you provide the air conditioning. It, re it will reduce it will reduce the greenhouse yeah, arrow. So it's like, it's like, I'm sure you've heard uh, of people doing solar panels. So what are we saying? Solar panels are the same. So that, you know, it's in the retrofitting of buildings, particularly these old high rises. I say old, they all look, I showed that to my wife and she said, oh, those aren't old, those are new buildings. No, in fact, most of those, this is in North Etopico. And most of those buildings were built in the 70s and 80s. Not new, new to me. <laughs> not new, not new to not. They're not new like the new uh, the new condos that are going downtown. So all of those buildings are going to have to be retrofitted. But the savings from the from the energy costs will be substantial, so substantial that within 10 years the costs will be collected. And, um, and uh, it'll be saving. There are companies now who, who, will, um, who will do this, you know, they will pay for this. There are companies that will put up the money to, to, uh, to, retrofit, to retrofit these buildings and they will take their profits out of the savings that are made. Okay, so it's remarkable. One of the things that's most interesting is in some of these ideas, is that the, the cost savings are so substantial that you know you ask yourself why aren't we doing this? Why aren't we doing that today? Well, you know, frankly, we need political leadership to do some of this stuff. You know, you know, I, Bill Freeman, sitting out in Toronto Island. Let me tell you, I could talk about it till I'm blue in the face. I'm not going to be able to do it. I, I mean, I, I wouldn't know how to begin. There are certainly people who do know how to begin. But, but with government leadership, we can do amazing things here. Solar panels the same, you know? Alternative energy. Um, you know, it's in the savings. It's in the savings. That's, that's where it is. Solar, wind. People are, people are beginning to talk about the electric city. And that, and that we, we generate our electricity with uh, alternative electricity. You know, getting off the grid is, is everybody's dream. You know, most of us will never get off the grid. But we, we can build. And in fact, Ontario, with its, with its cancellation, or, you know, they, they got rid of all the coal-fired uh, um, uh, power stations. Ontario's a leader on that. Uh, you know, air pollution, <laughs> air quality improved dramatically in some parts of Ontario because of that, dramatically. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, it'd be nice to see they could get off natural gas, but maybe that'll be next. You know, there are new technologies that are coming down here almost, almost by the week sometimes if you read them. You know, I'm telling you, I'm telling you a lot of these things that uh, you already know. That's Toronto Island. I had to put in something about Toronto Island. That's where I live. Hey, it's not so perfect. We got our problems too. But I learned, you know, how important communities are. And communities in this city are very... And, you know, I, I, this, is a, this is a picture of, of some people at, uh, participating in some of the workshops that Waterfront Toronto has put on. Waterfront Toronto has done a remarkable job of involving, involving people, citizens, uh, and uh, this, is, this is one of their workshops that they've done. And, and, uh, and it hasn't been, uh, you know, like we're the experts and we're going to do what we want. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. I know, I know some of the key people in this, and they, they have made changes to the plans of, of uh, Waterfront Toronto. That's the way we should be doing planning. Our planning system 
it would, it's wrong to say that it's broken. But we plan, essentially, our planning system has become an approval system. A developer comes with a plan for a high rise on a piece of property. The city planners look at it and they say yes or no or change it in such a way. Meanwhile, the real problem that we have, what we really need, is buildings appropriate for the people. We need affordability. We need the type of thing. We've got to find a way of building these things. I'm convinced we can do it, and we, I'm convinced we will do it. And that that's the core of what the new agenda has to be, is that we, it's, it's, we're going to have to create a new city. But there's nothing new in that, you know? Cities are always under criticism. They've always, they're a, they're a work in progress, as an artist would call it. Uh, and that's good. That's good. That makes it an exciting place to live. I think Toronto's a pretty exciting place. So my last... Show me show the cover of my book. So I cover all these issues and a lot more. And I cover them in a lot more depth. So let's see if we can have some questions. Yeah.